This is Keep on the Borderlands. Released in 1979 and written by the legendary Gary Gygax, it was one of the first modules, now referred to as Adventures, published for Dungeons & Dragons. In the years following its release, it became packaged with the basic set of first edition. Modules from the late 70s and 80s were a very different breed of D&D than what most people today are likely accustomed to. See, it wasn't until the mid to late 80s where universes such as Dragonlance, Mistara, and of course the Forgotten Realms came along that D&D started to shift towards existing as a device for storytelling. Before that, adventures were much more based around exploring the different mechanics of the rule set, dungeon crawling, and combat. There's nothing quite like opening up one of these old sets. If you're looking for something to instantly transport you back in time, these will certainly do it. There's something about the aesthetic that comes with these old boxes. The artwork, the assortment of manuals and tools, it's all very different from the largely single book style typically found today. Alas, these other source books and modules are all best saved for another time. Who knows, maybe I'll get some more use out of whatever the hell this setup is. Keep on the Borderlands is as much a player's guide to DMing as it is an actual module. The first pages are spent extensively detailing the role and responsibilities of a dungeon master, as well as the mechanics necessary to complete the adventure. Designed for parties from first to third level, the module provides the keep as a main base of operations and a few dungeons for exploration, specifically the expansive Caves of Chaos. Included in the 30-page module booklet is a bunch of maps, as well as meticulously detailed descriptions of the various encounters the party fights against. The party finds themselves pitted against a collection of lower difficulty monsters. Kobolds, spiders, basic humanoids, and goblins, among other things. Scant are any details about the NPCs that inhabit the keep. Those important enough that they aren't left to the DM's discretion are referred to only by their titles. There's no real quests, with players simply encouraged to start exploring after acquainting themselves with the areas of the keep. How much information to give the players, mostly through rumors, both true and false, was left up to the DM. That the module was specifically designed for both new players and DMs is very apparent, both in its simplicity and open nature, allowing for those on both sides of the screen to experiment and better learn the game. While there are a few points where the DM can insert their own creations, there is effectively nothing presented here that can't be completed without following both the module and first edition rule set to a T. That this was likely one of the first modules played by many a young tabletop gamer back in the 80s, its popularity has been enduring. Even today, it's frequently cited as one of the greatest modules of all time, received a sequel in 1999, and even a proper novelization. As I mentioned earlier, this copy of Keep on the Borderlands was included in the basic set. To the best of my knowledge, this is likely a seventh printing of said set. I've come to that determination due to two key factors. One, this particular box came with paper chits as opposed to proper dice. More importantly, however, along with the appropriate markings and codes, by all appearances, this is not a first print copy of Borderlands, which is what I'll be referring to it as from now on. Though there is seemingly no photo evidence that I could find online, the first print of Borderlands supposedly stated somewhere on the cover that it could be adapted for advanced Dungeons & Dragons, a tidbit which no later version has. See, Borderlands is considered what's called a generic setting adventure. That means, as you might expect, that it can be played in just about any universe. There's no presence of specific gods or unique mechanics that preclude it from any world. So yes, you could theoretically play through this module in the Forgotten Realms, or your own homebrew for that matter. But while it's possible to play through this adventure in any world, there is a reason why TSR removed the claim that it could be adapted to other rule sets. Adjusting modules to different rule sets is a deceptively difficult task, especially when dealing with one as structured as Borderlands. Enemies and mechanics work in different ways, as well as the fact that the players have different skills at their disposal. All of a sudden, a fight that may have been incredibly easy might be a bit too difficult, and vice versa. It's a shame too, because as fun as reading through these old modules is, it means that a fair bit of legwork needs to be done if one wanted to try and make them work with newer editions of the game. Which is why this video game conversion of Keep on the Borderlands is amazing.
played in Temple of Elemental Evil's 3.5 PC release and developed by the same folks who made the near-required Circle of Eight mod pack, both of which I talked about in one of my previous videos, this adaptation brings Borderlands to life within the 3.5 edition rule set, while managing to thread the needle between faithful recreation and modernized revamping. What makes the mod work so well is the way that it takes the existing material and embellishes where need be, primarily in two areas, inside the keep itself, and the combat scenarios. I'll start with the latter, mainly because it still makes up the large majority of the module's content and the fact that I can't wait to gush about this game's combat systems once again. The premise of the various combat scenarios from the areas they take place in, as well as the enemies you fight, are taken directly from the source material. Gygax's original writings say you fight lizard men in the swamp, so you fight lizard men in the swamp. They say you fight spiders in the forest, and so you fight spiders in the forest, and so on. The changes made mainly lie in the adjustments to enemy amounts, stats, and placement for the purposes of balancing them for 3.5. For example, the fight within the Lizardman den was written in the original to consist of, and I'm effectively quoting here, a lizard man with a dexterity of 9, an armor class of 5, 2 plus 1 hit dice, and 11 hit points, along with 3 lizard ladies, whom have very similar stats save for lower hit point values, and 8 young lizards who effectively do nothing. Well, considering the video game version of that includes a spellcasting shaman and 2 brutes with over 40 hit points, there's obviously been some changes made here. What's important about these changes is that they don't alter the feel of the situation. While these enemies may seem imposing, this was not a particularly difficult encounter, just as what Gygax wrote likely wouldn't have been all that difficult either. But were it not for these changes, if the encounters were lifted directly from the lines of text and put into the game, they would be laughably easy. Fighters in first edition were desperately trying to dumb themselves down for an extra point of strength. They weren't juicing their damage numbers with power attack, barbaric raging, or cleaving through swarms of enemies after scoring a kill. It's natural that combat would need to look a bit different when played in 3.5. These types of what I'll call controlled adjustments are present throughout the entire mod, and they allow Gygax's original work to make full use not only of 3.5, but also the awesome in-game combat systems found in Temple of Elemental Evil. I'm going to try and refrain from going too far into detail, rehashing old topics and all that, but the combat found in this game remains, in my opinion, one of, if not the best D&D video game adaptation to date. It's the perfect mix between turn-based strategy and forced on-the-fly creativity. That nothing really ever goes as planned is a testament to the design and implementation, as well as the fact that while this entire mod is mostly a low-level affair, the combat manages to stay exciting and engaging. I would say the Caves of Chaos are where the best really starts to come out. By the time you reach them, your party, whatever size, has likely gotten a few levels, and unlike me, are no longer completely useless members of society. That doesn't mean the earlier areas are a breeze. If anything, they can be a bit challenging. Luckily, there are a number of new recruitable NPCs of a broad swath of skills that can join your party to lend a hand if you find yourself stuck. Where the mod really plants its flag is inside the keep itself. In case I wasn't clear earlier, the keep in the original adventure is basically just a place for the players to take a snack break between fights. This is in spite of the fact that there are a lot of places inside, featuring multiple different shops and guard towers, as well as a church, tavern, and merchant's guild. But nothing could really be done with them. The best the party could do was find out that one of the priests might be obviously evil and then do nothing about it. In contrast, there is a lot for the player to do in the adaptation. Numerous quests, both remastered from the original and brand new, are pretty much everywhere the player looks. Most are taken from a bounty board found inside the provision shops, but some require a bit more intuition to uncover, as well as mingling with the newly named townsfolk. The quests, while not narratively deep, do wonders to help bring a sense of life to the keep and the surrounding world. The people and creatures now have a purpose and motive beyond existing to perpetuate the party's quest for adventure. No spoilers, as per the usual, but I will say that I particularly enjoyed the ones that worked off the original content. Seeing the old encounters have some new life breathed into them was pretty neat. Some of the new quests do feel a bit… odd. I can't wrap my head around how a thieves guild managed to take up residence in the sewers beneath what is supposedly a rigorously fortified and watched keep. But hey, more evil to vanquish means more experience for me, so step aside, boys, because good lord, I did not roll a pure barbarian to suffer through one attack a turn. 
There are some aspects to the quest systems that I'm not a huge fan of. It's easy to miss out on conversations and even entire quests if you aren't so much as in the right place at the right time. I get that it's supposed to encourage proactive investigation and assessment of these surroundings, but the fact that there can often be little indication as to how to find and complete these quests can make it feel almost a little bit player hostile. At the same time though, that aspect of learning your way around town is a large part in what helps make the keep fun to explore. It goes back to the point of everything feeling alive, with NPCs changing their location depending on the time of day and other overtly pressing matters having time limits attached to them. There's still no proper story present, even with the new quest, but that isn't necessarily a bad thing, especially because the mod doesn't actually take itself all that seriously. There is a lot of sarcasm in the dialogue, as well as plenty of moments where the player can lean into the occasional absurdity put in front of them. This type of blasé theme might be off-putting to some, but in this situation, I thought it worked well. I have no problem with a game having little in the way of a story, but I cannot stand when I'm given nothing and then expected to take said nothing seriously. If I'm going to run around with hardly any purpose outside of killing monsters, then I'd much rather do it with some jokes as opposed to unwarrantedly high stakes. Lost in all of this are the additions made to skills. Characters now have the ability to train in crafts such as climbing and use rope, both of those are pretty important by the way, as well as a fleshed out alchemy system. Not to mention the fact that diplomatic checks aren't nearly as hot and cold as they are in the base game. Characters can certainly attempt to bluff or intimidate, but the fact that they have the ability to do so doesn't mean they will be successful. Several languages are also present, meaning that you may need to initiate dialogue with someone you rather wouldn't. My paladin was great for dealing with just about anyone in the keep, but the fact that she only knew common put quite the damper on her expertise when dealing with the monsters of the wild. There's also a disguise feature, but I'll be brutally honest, I never found a use for it. There probably is one, don't get me wrong, but... My pea brain certainly couldn't track it down. But that might be the best part of the entire mod. Regardless of everything that was added and reworked, you can ignore all of it. If you want to ignore the keep and traverse the dungeons as a ravenous murder hobo just as in the original adventure, you're more than free to do just that. To my knowledge, there isn't a problem put in front of you that can't be solved by taking a sword to whatever it is that stands in your way. And you know what? That's perfect. For me, while I thoroughly enjoyed the new ways in which some of the material was presented, the real joy came from the fact that I was playing Keep on the Borderlands in a video game with a non-archaic rule set. And I can confidently say, after reading through the original module, God knows how many times during this video's creation, that the original premise has been well and truly maintained. And yes, that does include the presence of a certain moral dilemma surrounding enemies you fight, which I will not mention here because YouTube will likely have an aneurysm if I do. If you ever wanted the chance to experience an old D&D module without the worry or task of making it work in modern rule sets, this is probably the best way to do so. Whether you're the new player that the original module targeted or an old warhorse in search of a classic made new, this mod is for you. Play it.